Tip for the Giro d'Italia Stage 6 recap. That's nearly a third of the way through the Giro for those that can do maths at home. The Naples Amalfi Coast stage, probably the most picturesque stage of cycling we've had this year and probably of the Giro d'Italia as well, although we've got uh, snow covered, four metre snow walls tomorrow, theoretically. It's from Naples. They go south. They skirt both sides of uh, Vesuvius. That's a slight historical interest. And then they go along the Amalfi Coast. It's treacherous they were very very lucky today that they didn't have the weather of yesterday because that it could have been absolute carnage uh two climbs of real note the valico de chunzi 8.3k 6.2 percent and then they go along the coast a little bit really hard rollers like quite difficult and then they do another climb the pico sant'angelo before a descent uh into onto the run in back to naples which was up and down and then the last 10 15 k's of this was chaos like road furniture paved streets, corners, roundabouts, a little uphill kick that I didn't really see on the profile of two Ks to go. Actually, a really, really good stage. I would say a better, in terms of quality cycling, a better stage today than the one yesterday, which was more just crash carnage because the the rain. But were you surprised, Benji, that... Well, let's talk about a few teams here. FDJ, EF, uh, AG2R and Cofidus, teams that don't have maybe even Ineos, Yolo Cometa, Bardiani, Antomarche. Why are they not in this break? Why are they not demanding that they're getting in the breakaway? Or even UAE, who don't mind a breakaway? So many riders that don't necessarily have their sprint or a versatile sprinter, like you say, that should have been in this break, and maybe there was a... A bit of a fight for the breakaway, but not as much as I would have expected on a break like this, knowing that there's, first of all, the pure sprinting teams can't really pace at the front to try and control at the start here because it's so hard that there's pure sprinter might drop. So in a stand off for Cavendish, well, not the perfect example, but you know what I mean. The pure sprinters won't be liking a high tempo. Then the versatile sprinters, those are the teams that will be looking to control the breakaway affairs, control riders that go into the attack to make sure that their versatile sprint has a chance. So that's a limited amount of teams. That is maybe Trek, maybe Bahrain, Alpecin I'm looking at. Yeah. Movistar is kind of on the edge for me. Gavidia can climb on half the stages, can also averagely climb on half the yeah. stages when it comes to a sprinter. So that's what I'm not sure about. So I was expecting more teams to try and go in the breakaway, but eventually we settled with a breakaway that is kind of in two pieces. Because we've got a, a group of five at the front. Gavazzi, Simon Clark, the Marquis, Charlie Quarterman, and the Lettre. So we've got two ex-teammates there. Clark and uh, the Marquis were together at Israel last at Israel, year. Yeah. And we've got one dude behind, Alessandro Vere, yeah, who was in like a... That was, that was terrible. Solo chaspatat, mate. But not just for a little bit like, oh, I'll get across the break. He kept riding in the chaspatat for over an hour. Is it? it it's... If you were... If I was the agent of a rider and I saw that that's how that team operated, yeah, man, I would be like, what, what's going on? Is that in the same way, for example, as we sometimes see in breakaways, uh, a Bardiani or uh, a team that is expected to be in the breakaway of an Italian race like this, not be in the breakaway, and then they have to like ride at the front of the peloton with an yeah. entire team to catch the breakaway to then send someone in the breakaway. I feel like, like this is the same thing. In Catalonia, Uscatel, in the first stage, had yeah, to yeah. chase. Yeah, exactly. I feel like this was the same thing. Arkea probably said to their riders, get in the breakaway, and they all missed it. So Very was the one that had to clean up the mess by attacking behind the breakaway and just shots patating behind. So not the greatest uh, event in cycling, that's for sure. But what were like kind of the follow-ups there? Because in the first the breakaway, getting over the climbs, who are the strongest riders in there? The Mark and Clark are the best climbers, best overall riders in this break by far. And yeah, I, I just was really surprised that, I mean, one of those teams in the break is a team with a sprinter that's just won a stage, Michael Matthews. So Jaco thought this could be 50-50. We could work all day on the front as well and not get anything out of it. Yeah. And they put a rider in the breakaway. And so... If I'm looking at Caicedo, Magnus Court, Betiol, Healy, a break stage hunting team, I'm like, why are EF not in this break? And then I look at Kung, Army Better Rail, nah, it's not hard enough. But he's he's team, a though. he's a mount Intermarche Rota in the breakaway. I know he might have crashed or Patili. 
I'm or Fiorella. No, nah, Fiorella, I can't. He nearly broke his hand yesterday. He started. <laughs> Forget that. But I'm just really, really surprised. Um, now, I know Age of Tomorrow won a break, but yeah, I thought even yesterday, I still think yesterday, based on the events of today, a few good riders in the break, or if Alperson didn't want to work today, put old Dani in the breakaway. Um, but in the end, it was quite narrow roads. It got blocked up, so maybe it wasn't really possible to get in the breakaway because th they did block it up fairly well. Bahrain wanted to go for Milan today. They worked really, really hard, uh, Bahrain victorious. But yeah, the climbs, it was wet. It was actually quite wet on the first climb. Breaks at five minutes. It's chilled. No one's getting dropped. It's, it's going to be a sprinter's day. Breaks five minutes and then it's wet. And then the, there's a short descent and then another pickup. And then the rest of the descent is actually largely dry with the sun on it. But Ineos come to the front with the, uh, the plus, I think, and yep. just start driving it. But not from like, I'm used to seeing the five, last 500 meters, everyone sprints to get first position. They had six minutes left on the first climb. Now, maybe they were trying to see if Remco had a problem um, Maybe. by pacing hard. But yeah, they, they took 90 seconds out of that break, nearly two minutes, very, very quickly, Ineos, to maintain front position for that wet section, uh, trying to keep Gaggenhard and, and Geraint Thomas safe. I would say they probably, Ineos have the best one-two pairing right now of yeah. Mountain Domestiques in Civicov and De Plus because Jumbo got Koos, okay? Yeah, Quickstep have Hit and Van Wilder. And right now, it looks like Sivakov and De Plus are the best two. Yeah, and when it comes to Quickstep, I feel like Firvaka has shown to be better in this first week so far than Hirf and even Van Wilder on stage four as well, because Van Wilder had a, had a bad day that day. Let's keep that in mind. He didn't just drop on purpose because he has the, the reserve bike of, of Remco, so he must have had a, a bad day that day. But anyway, because Ineos is spacing in the peloton, the breakaway also starts to panic, and that's why we see those two riders, those two strongest climbers, getting a gap on the others because they need to, they need to get their move on because they need to make sure the gap stays ahead. The Marky and Clark are those, are those two riders, and they basically settle out on an adventure of ex teammates. The couple goes ahead and drops everybody. Those other riders basically get caught by the peloton, and they're off for a was it 70, 80 kilometers yeah. together. So very strong at that point in the race, but still a gap of two minutes, and I'm like. That on paper should not be enough to keep it until the finish at this point there. Yeah. But the domestiques for the teams are quite tired at this point. Like for Trek, for Bahrain, they're quite tired. Alperson are not helping at all. They're not putting a man forward. Um, and of course, you know, Alperson, when they win a stage, they're then their motto, as you saw in UAE Tour, Ukraine got invaded by Russia and then Alperson refused to chase the breakaway and Gazprom somehow won a 100-watt day sprint stage from the break because uh, Alperson refused to chase. Um, they were in that sort of mood again today, despite Groves looking really, really sharp. In fact, Alperson should have been pacing the climbs harder. Yeah. Why? Because Groves is undroppable right now. And actually, why aren't you pacing the climbs to drop Jonathan Milan, to drop Fernando Gaviria in this, for the sprint coming up, or at least make it much, much more difficult for them? That's the approach I would have taken, uh, because... You know, two Giro wins is better than one Giro win, especially when you've got the rider who's the second favorite for the stage. And especially knowing that we've seen Bahrain pace half their team away at this point in the race. So if exactly. Alpacin starts pacing on those climbs as well to also put pressure, then it might put Milan in, a, in trouble because it's not half of, of his domestiques are already gone. Yep. And we've seen that Milan has weakness on Lauren climbs, like you predicted early on in this Giro, by the way, in that third stage, I think, the one with the hill at the end, the one that was a longer climb than five minutes, a 25-minute-ish effort. That's where Milan had trouble. So here that, that trouble could have, uh, could have been used by Alpecin. But hey, they didn't add a rider. Movistar did not add a rider at this point either. And the gap kind of became bigger to 229. And it stayed at 229 for 30 kilometers. And I was like, oh God. Then we switched to Hungary for a bit. Then we switched back. And it was yeah. still 229. But then we saw a difference. Then we saw a difference with two teams adding a rider, which was... Alperson and Movistar. Yeah, they, are, they added them for a bit. You saw Gaviria talking to Trek. Trek probably saying, you've got Carlos Verona. You've got uh, Rojas, who's quite good on these sort of stages. You've got Will Barta. You've got Oscar Rodriguez. I mean, okay, you, you're going for Ina Rubio GC perhaps, but you can probably afford to spend a rider. So again... I don't know why these teams don't just put the rider early. I really don't. Um, I don't know why, like, what game there is to play because it's not like 
Verona is really going to help so much in the final 3Ks anyway. Like, wouldn't it be better to just have him pace some of the climbs where he's more useful? for? And then you can actually assemble your train better with Rojas yeah. and Cantor and Torres, or maybe Torres if he's still here. Anyway, I just was surprised by it. And, and we see this a lot. Teams trying to, they think they're playing a, like a 5,000 IQ game. And it's like, I mean, sort of, if you have some sort of unbelievable lead out and you don't want to, like for yeah. Bahrain, actually, Bahrain is spending Pascal on, but he's the last man of Milan. They threw everything at it. And, and so it's like, well, they really are, okay, that's costing them. And, and maybe, well, Mobs, I think, well, that's what we want for him to, but I, I think it's not worth it. Uh, I would, if I was a sprinter, I'd probably rather have a bit more structure and get the train together and not have the break court so late. Yep, I think so as well. Now, just a quick catch up. We've had an intermediate sprint. Peterson took two points there. Matches took one point. And another factor that we haven't spoken about is the fact that Cavendish apparently crashed early in the stage as well. We've oh. seen some pictures floating around. At least our our producer Luke Hefte is the man that saw those pictures floating around. And that's two crashes in a day. And that's also probably part of the reason that he was. 13 minutes behind at this point with roughly 40, 30 kilometers to go. I don't know how much time he lost in the end of the stage. He's probably within time though, because he had like an, an entire army of Astana yeah. riders around him. But we're getting into this later phase of the race and it's starting to get tense because the Alpecin and Movist rider did help and the gap went down to, let's go into the final 10 kilometers. We see the gap is roughly one minute, a bit above one yeah, minute at this point. And you're like, they should catch this easily, right? But Alpecin is not in the front anymore, and Movistar is not at the front anymore, or were they? I'm not sure about Movistar. I mean, I still saw mainly like Tesfazion, Gabriel's Gabir, eventually Molima. If you do want to watch back this hectic final 10 kilometers, GCN Plus is the best place to do so. Multi language audio, got uh, so many languages covered, so you can listen in your language of choice, watching every kilometer of this Giro on demand, short form, long form highlights on your, eye, on your phone. Which, by the way, yeah, on iPhones, I'm pretty sure uh, you can listen to the audio with the phone closed through your AirPods or yeah. through your, your headphones. No, everyone has AirPods. I'm kind of out of myself there. Mine, <laughs> mine barely work half the time, so not an endorsement. I throw them at the wall half the time. Um, can confirm. <laughs> yeah, listening through your headphones, you can listen to the commentary if you're in the car, if you're walking around or doing whatever. If you want to keep, you know, I like doing that. Sometimes you've got to take the dog for a walk during the middle of the stage, but I like to have the audio and the commentary in just in case something, you know, something pops off with 150 Ks to go. That's the beauty of having wall to wall coverage. Go and check it out for 15% off an annual pass through the link down below. Thanks to GCM plus for sponsoring LRCP during the Giro. I thought what I thought when at 10 Ks to go was okay. Bahrain Trek have got it to a good point, held it to one minute. Let's yeah. say I thought then the nervousness from the sprint teams was going to in effect, close the breakaway. I thought Ineos, Yumbo, Quickstep were going to come to the front and really dominate the front. And apart from Ineos did, but Yumbo didn't. Athene, I don't remember Athene and Dennis really going to the front and driving it. And I really don't yeah, remember. Yeah, but we did have a mechanical of Roglic, true, right? True, true. I don't know what K that was. 14 Ks. 14 Ks to go. Roglic has, we don't know if he's crashed. There's a hole in his bib shorts. We see the replay. He hasn't crashed. He's just had a planned mechanical because his teammates are around him. He's got the bike computer off, goes to the right side of the road, change the bike, no problem. So yeah, maybe maybe that's the reason why because he had a flat probably at 20Ks to go yeah. and then they found a place to to actually change. Okay, scratch them. But again, I, uh, apart from Ineos, I didn't really see the GC teams dominating the front compared to the other stages. Uh, but that was a nervous moment for Roglic because this was tight Havé roads to move up in the cars. Yeah, especially with all the motorbikes between the cars and then the cars move left and right before corners and then Roglic has to go in the inner corner while the other teams are trying to solve something there. But there's so much chaos there and then suddenly we see like a road furniture that is really dangerous. The Marquis almost, Crazy. well, they hop over it basically in the breakaway, Clark and the Marquis. Pretty cool to see, but pretty dangerous in the first place. And I was like, in the peloton, something has to happen, but nobody hit the sign apparently. Like nobody rode into it, nobody rode into the road furniture. But I will say that Thomas had a mechanical just after it. And then we see the same exact chasing scenario also going into the final where Ineos is pulling so hard and there's a bit of a chaos with the cars there. I don't, I'm not 100% sure if everything that happened was UCI legal, but we see 
Thomas behind his car with his team. They're pulling him through a lot behind the car. And then the cars are being pulled out. So a barrage happens. That's when the UCI commissaire probably tells every car, go to the side. Uh, they're playing a bit too much with their car. We don't like that. Um, and then the Ineos car jumped ahead again and they yeah. were riding behind the car again. But they came back. But what the hell was happening there? Uh, I mean, I don't know if there was a barrage put yeah. in. There just seemed to be a huge gap. It looked like there was, but then did the Ineos car just get backed off in a corner? I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know whether he crashed or not or just dropped a chain as well. No. I'm glad no one got fully taken out of that yeah. corner because that corner was crazy with that road furniture. Um, but he came back with Ganner and Co. Sivakov or, or Swift was looking after Gagenhart. Gagenhart was like in first three wheels for a lot of this running. But then I was thinking, we're going to get to 3Ks to go, 2.7Ks to go. We get there. Borov kept Vlasov to the front. Get any officer at the front. Jacob were moving up. Where's the sprint teams? They yeah. still got 25, 30 seconds. <laughs> if it's any officer not going to drive this to the line with one rider, especially now it's under three cages to go and Thomas has got back on, thankfully, and Bohr are going to pull up stumps too, who's going to actually drive this? And Alperson had four riders, four riders, including Groves, and they weren't pulling at this point. I was really surprised. Um, first of all, because I would kind of want to have your lead out through these corners you know being first in the first five wheels and then you can back off a little bit so i was really as a dangerous game they were playing i also thought at this point i thought jaco should could have blocked better i know there's a huge because listen you got demarkey in front with clark yeah. clark is the better sprinter clark is one he beat who did he beat in the sprint in the in the cobble stage in the tour last year anyway uh taco taco he clark got a decent kick on him he came second to MVP in the Amstel 2019. DeMarkey's not going to win that sprint, especially pulling 50-50 to the line. And then he's got bling behind. So he's also got a second reason why, well, okay, I, can't, I also can't pull full with you to lose a sprint when I got someone who has a possible chance to win the sprint. So, but the problem was the break was so tight. So, but I thought, could ja I thought Jacob could have come up and blocked a little bit through the corners, but I think they were kind of trying to set up Matthews for the sprint at the same time. Um, Maybe DeMarkey told them my legs are completely done, so just go for bling and I'll try hang on to Clark as well. So maybe th th that's stupid what I'm saying anyway about blocking. But yeah, who was going to actually take over eventually? Like who did actually with two Ks to go? But was or was it just the drag that killed them? There was this hill out of nowhere. Yeah, this this little little cobble climb came out of nowhere. I was I was like, am I in Flanders again? Is this the Copenhagen? But it, it wasn't as hard as the Copenhagen, but it was pretty uh. Pretty false flat, a bit yeah. more than false flat even, and I think that's where the breakaway started dying more and more, because you got to keep in mind, these guys have been riding at the front with two of them for ages, and now they're coming to a point where they're completely empty and they need to push through that, through that suffering to, to try and make it to the line, and they're still in hope because the gap is still there, and every time I see the camera from behind, I'm like, okay, these teams are kind of playing around. We see a Trek rider moving on the left side to the row, of the road to the front again, because at the front, they're kind of looking at each other again. And it's like the domestiques were starting to empty of the teams that were doing something. And then a Bahrain rider tried to come around on the right side again. So another domestique. But these riders have already suffered, have already domestiqued. So it was a, a fight of dead swans. I don't know if that's even <laughs> an expression in English, but I just I copy pasted means. it from, from Flemish. But um, we've got the last... Two kilometers, like you said, 25 second gap. I'm like, this is going to be really close. You started shouting, break will win, Peloton will win, break will win, Peloton will win. <laughs> and 15 seconds, 1.2 kilometers, and I'll let you lead it in. They have 1K to go. They're still working together, but they look really, really tired. And all of a sudden, DeMarco gives a shake of the head to Clark uh, with about 900 meters to go. And we're like, if, he, if they don't pull, they're done. Because we can see the Peloton yeah. six, seven seconds behind. Cuts to the Peloton. Cuts back to the breakaway. DeMarkey suddenly rolled through on the front. Clark hasn't taken a strong pull, and it's, it's over. Well, they're not even going to get to sprint for the win, really, at all, or the minor places. They're swamped with 300 meters to go after. I mean, they played their cards up to that point really well. Could Clark have driven it in and just trusted, you know, okay, DeMarkey's going to finesse me. I just got to ignore that and ride, or I assume he's also just fully cooked as well. So... Hard to really be critical of, of two of the guys who do the right thing, which is getting in this breakaway to give their, ch their teams the best chance of winning this stage today. So 
not going to criticize him. It's just how it played out in the end that the Peloton was able to catch them in the last 300 meters with Fernando Gaviria doing as we said. <laughs> we said this would happen. He launches with 350 to go, huge acceleration, like huge burst. And I don't know why he does this. I, I understand why he does this when there's in Romandy, when yeah. there's a corner coming up and you can use that to your advantage. I don't know why he does this in UAE Tour and he does this in the exact same sort of finish, provides a perfect lead out. Milan and Pedersen surf the wheel or surf his wheel. Pedersen comes out of it. Milan can't really... I yeah, mean, with Milan hitting win for that long, he just isn't going to win a lot of World Tour sprints because he just, he's so unaerodynamic. Like, he just, he's bobbing up and down. And yeah, but I also think he doesn't use the arrow to his advantage as much as, but even though he's not aerodynamic, he's like evading to be in the draft of Peterson while Peterson is yeah, in the draft of yeah. everybody else because he's sprinting next to him while Peterson just jumps from draft to draft. And at that point, I'm like, if you're in the draft of Peterson and try to come around in the end, you might have a bigger chance then sprinting next to him while Peterson is benefiting from Gavidia's draft, from Consoni's draft, who also sprinted early, by the way, Consoni. But then again, that guy probably can't make it if he sprints late, so yeah. might as well try to go early at that point. So, But hey, like you said, Peterson is the one that comes around. Peterson is the one that makes it happen. And the first sprint stage, he cra was involved in a crash. Yeah, Not yeah, sure if he yeah. actually crashed, but he was involved in some shape or form. Then yesterday he was boxed in. Uh, he got destroyed by Matthews in that one stage, unexpectedly, to be fair, in my opinion. But he delivered, and now he delivers a one Grand Tour victory in all three Grand Tours. And now Molimo's the man that needs to do it in Trek as well, because he's now the guy that oh, needs really? to fulfill the three, three, uh, three Grand Tour stage per one per Grand Tour yeah. stage. You can, I, I can't explain. Demarky done it. Demarky was on. Could have done it as well. I think. I think he's won in the. Or was he not won in the Tour de France? He must have won in the Giro, right? He's Demar won three yeah. stages of La Vuelta. He's won two, twice second at the Giro in 2012 and 2021. Oh, he's never won a tour stage. So he's just no. won, he's just won three, three Vuelta stages. Anyway, so he's nowhere near and he probably won't do it. Um, Pedersen wins ahead of Milan. Ackerman third. UAE, I don't think, were riding for Ackerman earlier. I think they were just keeping Vine and Almeida no. safe through the Amalfi Coast towns. Groves fourth, Gaviria fifth after leading it out. Matthew sixth, Albanese seventh. Very versatile rider. Meyerhofer, eighth. So that's curious that DSM switched to him instead of Dainese today. From, well, let me just check. Did Dainese drop? Um, Dainese did drop. He was on 14 minutes. So that explains Meyerhofer yeah. going for DSM. Rota, ninth. Velasco, tenth. I would say I'm going to pick those four names from the last rest of the top 10. Meyerhofer, Rota, Velasco, Albanese. Albanese, less critical. He got in the break the other day. Those other three, Meyerhofer, Rota, Velasco, they're not winning this bunch sprint, man, against Groves, yep. Milan, Gaviria, Pedersen. They really are not, especially Velasco and, and Rota. They're not that guy. I, they, he really should be in the break or trying to get in the break. Now, listen, if, if in neutral zone, five teams said, hey, break is not going to be more than four guys, five guys today. These teams are not getting in it. Fine, whatever. But... You can still try. <laughs> they're, yep. not, they're not your boss. Um, <laughs> but anyway, because this the Naples stage last year also was one from the break with De Gent, but that was a bigger break. Uh, but Pedersen gets the job done. The update on the sprint points, Milan is clear, more clear in, in first on 110, Groves on 99, Pedersen bumps up to 83, Matthews on 54. So Milan looking pretty good, but... We've got some more versatile stages uh, to come. In terms of KOM, Pino is still up there. GC, yeah. no change in the top 10. Yeah, that's all there is Chiclamino? from the stage. Pardon? Chiclamino? I just did Chiclamino. Oh, yeah, um, uh, my bad. One more thing. The mark he did mention after the race, I wanted to win, so I played a game with Clark. Fair I enough. knew he was faster than me. I refused to pull, which I never did in my career so far. But, um, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I think it's fair enough. Like I said, they have Matthews behind. He's not the quickest in the sprint, like, what is second in a Giro stage going to do for his career? Nothing. You don't get a bonus for second in a stage in a Giro. Um, so no. I agree with kind of what he did. Uh, That's it kind of, eh? Yeah. What else can we say about this stage? Uh, Remco was mad at some spectators. There was a pave <laughs> section in Sorrento, and despite Catania being in the middle of the road with no danger whatsoever, Remco rode on the gutter of the road yeah. near the outstretched arms, telling them to get back, despite them having position at the front. I, was, I know. I would suggest just maybe ride behind Catania's wheel and 
chill out. I think he's jealous of Juanpe. I think he wants True, to be yeah. El Patron. But El Patron, like those fans would go back in their home. They would not even be out there getting in his way. They Yeah, he, like... <laughs> he doesn't have to say anything. A few days ago, I went to the supermarket here in Andorra, and I stepped into the supermarket, and I switched around the milk aisle, and I saw a man standing there. <laughs> it was Schielmose with next to him, Juan P. El Patron, and I completely messed up my shopping list from that point onwards. It's irrelevant at that point. I saw El Patron, and I was so shocked that I... I scarily moved into the corner of the supermarket, let him do his thing, and then I went for my stuff. Juan Bay doesn't have to pay for groceries in Andorra. They've made a special law for him. That's the kind of guy he is. <laughs> um, anyway, tomorrow's stage, 218 kilometers. How many 200k stages have we had? A lot. These are beasts. And like, I look at this stage, right, and it really doesn't look that hard. It really doesn't. But when you factor in how many 200k stages we have had, when you factor in how hard today's stage was raced and also the stress and the difficulty of the other sprint stages, which weren't, there, there weren't those 100 watt stages like they had in the Grand, Grand Depart, except the Grand Depart in Italian, uh, Grande Partenza in Hungary last year. They haven't had those 100 watt chill stages and then a bit of a bunch sprint. And then I think, of the, look at the actual accumulated Denevel meters, which I think is well over 3,000 tomorrow. This is a this is a hard stage where I really wouldn't be surprised if some team takes it up to see gaps from Capua to Gran Sasso d'Italia, uh, Campo Imperatore. The first climb is 14.5 kilometers at 5%. Okay, it's not hard, but it's with 70Ks to go. And then there's another 7K, 6% climb with steeper sections for Rocco Rosso. The first 5Ks are at 7.5%. Then a descent, valley, bony sprint. Then a 13.5K, 6% climb, steady. Falls flat, 9k, 4% falls flat, or rolling ridge line. And then the last, let's say, five, let's last four kilometers of Campo Imperatore, two 2,120 meters, like decent altitude, is uh, averages around 8%. I think this is a much harder stage than I originally thought. Benji, given the week this happened and given the weather conditions, which I looked up, apparently it's like tomorrow at this time, raining. And one degree at the top. So it's perfect for the Primoz Roglic Vestgate issue. Yeah. But um, I will say, I think looking at yesterday's stage, I think that will be key for this stage, for Campo Imperatore, Gran Sasso d'Italia finish. Because if we go back to the Vuelta, we had Remco crash on Sierra Nevada. And there were weaker days of him afterwards. Oh, no, not on Sierra Nevada, but two days or so before Sierra Nevada, one day before Sierra Nevada. Then he had a weaker moment afterwards. And when I look at the specific parkour, like, it's not the deadliest, but I do expect people to test him. And, like, first of all, we didn't recap what injuries Remco had yesterday because it came out after we finished our podcast. But if you think about that, he had something about a hip infringement, yeah. something with a sacrum bone and some contusions on his right or left, whatever, one or one of its sides. So if that is true, what that doctor says, which I'm pretty sure we can trust what a doctor says, even though he's a team doctor, then I'm expecting a, a, an Ineos, a Yumbo, to at least try and push to see if Remco has something. Why wouldn't Ineos try and win the stage with Gaganard tomorrow? Roglic has crashed himself and didn't do a good TT. They won't, Thomas. Re I, well, but here's the rationale. Remco crashed twice, and for some reason the doctor did a piece to camera which they shared on social media saying, actually, yeah, his hip is a little bit cooked, which is very curious, unless... Why did you do that? Unless it's mind games, but I don't... Like, he did crash. Like, he, he, he did crash. So <laughs> I don't think it's... Like, he might... I wouldn't be surprised if his hip was a little bit hurt. I think that was bizarre, um, frankly. Um... Gagenhart won in Valenciana on a similar sort of finish, not to altitude, but he had no problem to altitude in the 2020 Giro. Like, are Ineos really in a position where if they have, I'm not saying they're the favourites, but if, they, if the break doesn't win, what chance would you give Gagenhart in a sprint with a lead out from Duplus and Sivakov? What chance would you give him in a sprint from a group of eight against Roglic and, and Remco. I'd give him uh, over 20%. In, yeah. in Tirreno, in that uphill finish, he was not far. Roglic, and Roglic did not beat everybody by bike lengths, bike lengths. Um, 
it's it's still a Giro stage win. You don't know what could happen for the rest of the three weeks. I mean, I would go for it with Gagenhardt. Go for the stage. And the same thing probably for Yumbo. Like, if you're looking at this, if you're Yumbo, 4K is 8%. For Roglic. Need to try it. With Remco's, with his, you know, cold weather and could be injured yeah, or but impinged. I'm much... You're talking about cold weather about Remco, but I'm much more fearful when it comes yeah. to rainy cold weather for Roglic than I am for Remco. Yeah, it's yeah. not on for me. It's still in my memory <laughs> at the front right here. Yeah. Because uh, that vest issue that he had there, the issue that he had coming back at the end, he lost time on that stage. And it's not the only stage like that that has happened in the past. Pyrenees in the rain as well at some point. Also a weaker day. But they have to try. Like, why would you not try knowing that he crashed? And if Roglic feels good, then he needs to try to win the stage. And if... The Ineos problem for me is, like, like what you also know is the factor that we saw them pacing on um, Lago Laceno instead of trying to benefit from the situation because they probably were trying to prevent Remco Roglic to attack Thomas. Because Thomas is the weaker link of the two, in my opinion, at the moment. I don't know if he's grown since the, since the one-week race he's done before the Giro. He might if He might be near a, a competent level when it comes to the GC guys now. But if I think that true... If they go for Hegegen Hart, they might be punishing Thomas in that sense. But at some point, you will have to make a decision. But maybe for them, in their eyes, it might be too early. Okay, so Thomas comes fifth, same time as Gagen Hart on the punchy finish. Yeah. Gagen Hart wins. Roglic takes six. Remco takes four on, Ga on Thomas. That's riding for the podium, man. Eh? Is that really so bad? Like, what do you mean? If Gagan Hart wins the stage, but Thomas loses bonies to Roglic and yeah, but Remco, come on. Unless he loses time. I mean, okay, if he loses time tomorrow, he's fucked, man. <laughs> if he's losing big time on this finish, what's, what's going to happen on... Transmontana. Uh, which is in a week. <laughs> so, I mean, there is a limit to it. Like, yeah. I understand keeping two guys in GC, um, and if he is having a bad day, you don't want to... But, but if he's just on his level and it's not good enough... Or, and, and also, I don't think Thomas would get dropped. I don't... He looks, he looks really skinny and... I think he looks in good shape, and his TT was... Uh, no, it wasn't that good, was it? Um, <laughs> UAE. UAE is another team. Like, do you, If I'm them, I'd probably just put Ulysse and Kovi in the break, to be honest. That's the easier decision for me. Um, I would put those two in the break and go for it that way, and for Molino uh, or McNulty. If nah, Quick, Mignolzi won't be allowed by Quick Step. I think Formula should stay with their GC leader. No, at but least. One, one of two, you can't have more than two in the break. So yeah. try and get two in the break of those four. The other have to help Almeida and Vine. Yeah, but I trust Formula more as a domestique than I trust Kovi as a domestique, yeah, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. Kovi can go on the break. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Ko Kovi's been in the Gruppetto for 17 days, probably. Yeah, but, but he'll be fine if he can go for his own result. I exactly, think. and he'll suddenly be good. <laughs> like Fidaya. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think Almeida, the thing with this climb as well is. It has that 6% long section at the start, and then the last portion is also very steep, the hardest part of the yeah, climb, yeah. really. But he can't drop before Calasio. Like, huh? if, he does the, like if he does his dropping skill, he can't do that early on the climb because the, the flat the far portion in the middle of the yeah. climb, the flatter portion in the middle of the climb, is so long that it'll, it'll be destroyed by draft. So he needs to stay on the back, at least, of the front group until the steep section, which I think he will... And on the steep section, it's too short for him to do his yo-yoing at the back, I think. No, no, he has to, you have to keep the wheel. You yeah. have to, man. So if, okay, Calis, Calici, I can't say, Calicio, 13.5k, 6%. It's, it's about half an hour climb, over half an hour. In, it could be in the cold and rain. And then, and then that 4% with steeper sections in it, if that's also in the cold and the rain, now we're getting over to 1500 meters altitude. Like that suddenly those, that 4% and the 6% pinches feel a lot heavier than they might have originally. Who, if, if Gagan Hart, I'm going to list these riders. And you have to say if the other teams should pace, if they drop, Almeida drops, should, should other GC teams pace if he drops on at some point? Which GC teams? As in any of them? Any, I might do any it. of them. Any of them? Yes. Blasov. I don't care. Thomas. UAE should pace, probably. Is who are the other GC contenders here? <laughs> That's a good question. Vine. <laughs> Vine. Uh, I think they're less likely to pace when Vine drops than when Almeida drops. Yeah, I think so. Obviously, if Avonapol drops, Yumbo will pace. If Roglic drops, Quickstep yeah. will pace. You would, <laughs> you would think. 
Um, <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> the manager, like, ah, don't worry about him. Now, who's we'll, going to be there to pay if Roglic drops? We'll get him in the third week. Um, My dude, who's going to be there if Roglic drops? Van Gulder, is he, is, you think this is a Van Gulder Gruppetto stage? I, I don't necessarily think that directly. Like Van Gulder has been not super consistent all over the days that he's doing. He's going to be there on the most important days, I think. But I was a bit worried after Lago Laceno because he shouldn't have dropped there. Yeah. I think if, if Almeida drops, I think you got to take him seriously and, and you got to put time into him. Yeah. I, I, you can't just let him after that TT he did on stage one. Yeah, but you can't let Almeida get away with the Almeida stages. But Quick Step and Yumbo only think about the other exactly. guy, I think. Exactly. You're not going to, exa- I know. But if I'm Ineos thinking podium, yep. and I know they want to win the race, but also like make grow the grass while the rain is raining. On Grand Sasso d'Italia, Where second, you, second day in a row. Second day in a row, I've got it. Okay, who you got for the stage tomorrow? McNulty. From the break. Wait, let's see how far he is. Oh, he's, he's now on 10 he, minutes and 10 seconds. Is that enough quick step? <laughs> Klaus Lodewick, can you get back to us? Leave a comment <laughs> on the video. Is 10 minutes enough for McN- McNulty? McNuggets? <laughs> yeah. He well, should be able to get in the break with quick that. Quick eh? should say, hey, Andreas, can you get in the break in pink, please? Get some more time. We didn't, for some reason, we didn't let you have five minutes the other day. So, Legnison's losing the jersey tomorrow, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, but who can take it if they go in the breakaway? Because the breakaway opportunity, ah, true. the climb's very long though, but the break opportunity is there. And Tom Schoens. So, Shit weather. I he's, don't on believe one, it. he's on 129 in GC. What did he get? Oh, because of the break <laughs> action he did earlier, but no, nah, I don't see it. Yeah, I don't see it happening. Why did Kemner tell everyone he was going for GC? Why wouldn't you just say, I'm doing what I do all the time? Yeah. And then maybe they're more likely to let you in the break. And he's on 154 in GC and he could have taken pink and then ridden. He's bottled then, opportunities. Then you ride for GC like O'Connor. This is what O'Connor did on, in the first week of the tour 2021. Exactly. I think uh, Molomo's probably going to try and come in the break. Yeah. I see that happening. Speed up. I would say someone of you of uh, EF will try and go in the breakaway. Ducati's too close. Cepeda has that opportunity, but it's kind of like, I, I gotta be honest, the ride is between like five minutes and 10 minutes is limited in GC at the moment. So that's tough. So you're already looking at a Conrad 424 Conrad, yeah. or a Rubio 325 or those kind of riders to do it or Lorenzo. Gonchi 435. Lorenzo who? Fortunato. Fortunato. Fortunato needs to be in the break. Yeah, the, all these guys, even Pozzo, like if they let Pozzo, like would you, would you, if you were quick state, would you care if Pozzo have got in the break? No, nah, but by the way, Will Barta, how is he on 245 still in GC without going in the break? That's strong. Eh? Good TT, didn't drop too hard on the other stages. He's going climbing... the break, nobody chases that guy. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of guys that should be trying to go on the break tomorrow. I, I do lean towards break winning a little bit, but I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Gagan Hart to win the stage tomorrow. Um, I really think his punch is quite good. Uh, okay. But of course, you know, the break will win by seven minutes, right? I've got Meg Nuggets. From the break? Yeah. For UAE, I think Kovi or one of the Italians. I think the cold for McNulty. Probably true, but still. Yeah. But well, he attacked 17 times in who's, a cold like who, Who's a wet weather specialist? Peterson. But okay, man. <laughs> Formula? <laughs> yeah, Formula was good in dog shit weather. Wasn't he in the break in on uh, Cortina D'Ampezzo? He went deep in the break with Almeida. I do stage. not remember, my friend. I do. Okay, but I'm sticking with Gagan Hart. It's not going to happen, but. From the break, I like one of the two UAE Italians. Uh, Kovi, Ulysses, three of them. Kovi, Ulysses, or Formalino. Okay. Um, Ackerman. <laughs> I mean, Ackerman's climbing so well. Groves. I, if, I was, if I was Groves, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Groves should get in the break with one of the Alperson guys. Why not? If he attacks in the valley before Kalashio, he can put a lot of pressure. He can get over the first climbs. He can put a lot of pressure on the other guys in the break. Chasing him. He can do good 30-minute power on 6%. Then it's a, a false flat uphill. Groves really should be in the break with another another teammate. I would do it. McNulty destroys him. Of course, but <laughs> he probably won't be allowed in the break by, um, by Cherny. Uh, did... Chiclamino. Will they let him in the break, the Chiclamino I mean, opponents? Come on. Do we have any resolution of the Trek versus Quickstep uh, chopping stuff yesterday? There was apologies on both ends. Did we just, did it come out that everyone's friends again? Sorry, it all happened. Let's, re- let's, let's move on. Well, whether they're friends or not publicly, I'm not so sure about it. I spoke with both behind the scenes and I don't know. 
can't say too much about it in the sense that they both say they apologize to to one another and it's all fine but and Steven de Jong just said which I agree with that Remco should probably just look ahead and not yeah. drift five meters to the right um what Remco told me is that he moved to the right out of respect for Arkea asking him to do so to let their train come through but I'm like Remco come on if if that happens I'm like fuck Arkea your safety is more important. Yeah, but he moved too far. Like there was yeah. enough space. Yeah. So he just needed to look straight. Um, but about that, a solution for that. Like if you're quick step, who cares who is at fault? You yeah, need to figure yeah, out yeah. how you can. It doesn't matter who's at fault if your GC guy goes down. Yeah, you got to try and avoid that situation next time. And we didn't really discuss that in depth yesterday. We, yeah. we discussed about three kilometer rule. For, uh, yeah. Uh, but how can they solve that? And Luke, our producer, mentioned to me, for example, what if what if Quickstep brings Remco to the side, for example, and then tries to draw back? Or how how can they prevent reducing the the speed bar from like sixty five k an hour to like forty five in no time? That kind of stuff. And there's so many small things that Quickstep could have looked at in this situation instead of looking to blame other riders. I agree. If you because this is what happens, right? The GC guy's finish line is the three kilometer barrier. So barrier. So what happens when you cross the finish line? What happens, Benji, when you, when me and you are cooked and we crest the finish of a climb? Mate, I'm never getting to the top in the first nah, place. No, you'll get there, but you'll get there. Or Dino this week. But what happens? You relax, right? Yeah. You switch off. Oh, I'm, sa I'm safe. The sprinters' teams are at their most stressed, and the stress is increasing as they're trying to fight for a stage win. And so those two, as I said yesterday, creates a creates a problem. And that's Trek trying to move up, and that's Remco's like, oh, I'll get out of your way because. I no worries, I'm just going to go to the back of the bunch. Uh, so maybe, yeah, Ballerini should have probably stayed in front of Remco as well. Um, yeah. But hopefully it doesn't happen again. I'm glad that no GC guys uh, lost. Oh, we didn't mention Jay Vine lost a minute. He got put in a minute 11, which is a shame. He had a mechanical issue that meant that he couldn't get straight back on the bike, I yeah, don't but think. They pulled, that, they pulled that all out of their ass, all these time gaps yesterday, I swear. The, the thing with me is like, I'm trying to fix in my head the situation at which Vine loses 111 and then he has to have had that mechanical issue at the crash of Roglic with seven kilometers he to did, go. Yeah. But then I made, I must also have had trouble there because I heard he Vine did, on yeah. social media or in an interview say that the team was focused on getting Almeida back at that point. So I'm like thinking... Well, Almeida wasn't put on time. So obviously he, he got the back. team around and he got back, yeah. But then Vine in reality finished ahead of the mo most of the gc contenders vine crossed the finish line ahead of almeida by the way ahead of almeida was once again yeah so they just because they were involved in the second crash but it's just a, a bit strange to me but anyway he's on 111 it's not the end of the world frankly if you got the legs in the tt on bondoni and on the tt like bondoni one minute's gonna look like a joke i think that between first and tenth position on that stage and the other stages if they happen is gonna Trans be montana my dude it's they're going to be 111 will look like a joke so yeah not the best obviously to lose time you don't want to lose time you can't don't have it and he finished if you look at today's stage he finished 12th i'm pretty sure yeah um so vine sprinted and beat jake stewart in, <laughs> in this stage so he obviously wasn't losing more time when will he attack almeida i mean attack almeida i mean accidentally how would you define attack almeida as in should they, shouldn't know. they be trying to use two? What's the point of having two GC riders if you don't use them? Exactly, but how will you do so? Because in tomorrow's stage, they can't do so. But for example, the stage afterwards is that kind of like hilly stage with those murals. Why couldn't they do it tomorrow? What if it's, what if it's really shit weather? Yeah, but it's he's going to be attacking trains. But it's, no, I mean, a group of 15. I mean, look at Lago Laseno. It's going to be hard tomorrow. What if there's a group of 15 and Almeida and he are there? Well, then he needs to do that. Yeah. But that's probably going to be in the later phase than of the course, last two. I'm long, talking last, last three. seven Ks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Agreed. I mean, that, if he can. It's not like Almeida wants someone to pace for him anyway. He does his own thing. So <laughs> uh, if you are two GC leaders, like everyone's like, oh, I'll keep juicy, two GC leaders. It sounds great. But it's like, well, you ought to use that to some advantage at some point. Um, because, yeah, if, as again, again, I'll say it, if Ineos don't let Gegenhart try and gain some time for the podium in this week when he feels good on good stages, and then G has a problem or drops badly in later stages, you've just you've just constrained Gagan half for nothing. Now they're hoping, listen, this first week is irrelevant. I kind of agree, to be honest. 
this yeah. in the third week if we have three guys two two gc guys and a domestique in a group of six on those crazy stages we can do some real damage playing those cards um i, I guess that's their thinking but we'll see i mean a lot can happen uh, until then but yeah you got any uh you got any other thoughts on this stage or tomorrow benji or nah, just a good good day of cycling good day of cycling looking forward to tomorrow looking forward to uh get dropped by you on a climb tomorrow morning as well are we doing, are we doing, uh, what are we doing tomorrow? Absolutely no clue. I'm just making something up and hopefully we go on a ride or on a hike or whatever. No, I am flying. As I said, people don't believe me. I mean, they said, it's you, true. You can't do 1500 watts for 50 seconds, but you can, if you adjust it, if you adjust the altitude, 200 watts for 10 minutes, that's actually 1500 watts for 50 seconds. If you understand cycling and ball, you'd know that. Anyway, thanks for listening as always. We'll see you with the stage seven recap tomorrow. I think it could be good. Ciao.